Hello, everyone, and welcome to Learning Outside the Lines, episode 19, uh, with Kyle and Glenn, or Glenn and Kyle. It doesn't really matter. Yeah, there's one less than 20. Yes, right? We're, uh, we're trucking right along. This is crazy. It uh, is. We're really excited. Today, we get a guest educator from across the pond. Um, yep. So, uh, Lake Janelle Lanier? Wilson, uh, so, what's that? Lake Lanier? No, well, not everybody watching this knows what Lake Lanier is, maybe, but not just the lake. No, I'm talking about the Atlantic Ocean, right? So uh, Janelle Wilson uh, used to actually teach uh, in the same school that me and Glenn did uh, years ago, and I guess not that long ago. It feels like it might have been long ago, um, but she is now over in, uh, in England. So we're going to have a chance to kind of get that perspective of what's going on in her That's world. Cool. Uh, science teacher, uh, she's got a specialty in chemistry, but we'll talk a little bit more about her uh, once we bring her on. Awesome. Uh, to start off with, we always like to share a little bit of good things going on in life. So, Glenn, what's going on, man? Well, I just wanted to real quick show something from my discussion boards um, that kind of happened naturally in my classroom. This is just a screenshot that I took. Um, and one of the things that I've been reflecting on that I miss the most about the classroom is just having my students talk with each other um, you know, just hearing their conversations, the stuff that naturally comes up. And it doesn't always happen, but I logged in this morning um, and one of the first things I saw was a little bit of that spark that just makes me feel like students are actually connecting about something in a real and meaningful way. Now, you know, granted this first post here, they were talking about making a connection between, they're reading one of the graphic novels called March and um, you know they're, they're talking about John Lewis and how he raised chickens and how he would preach to the chickens, but basically like he wouldn't let anything get in the way of um, of his dreams, and that's what that student got out of it. Well, they ended up having a conversation about fishing and kind of connecting over this like almost uh, you know natural experience of of, of I, I think he talks about like gutting fish and descaling them and I'm like that's that's an interesting place to take a conversation about like, with a graphic novel about the civil rights movement but for me that was actually the best part because I'm like they're actually talking with each other again and it felt so good to see that like you know, I was like, whatever, if they're talking about the graphic novel or not, they're, they, they took this thing out of it and then they're, they're connecting about that thing, that, that drive that they have to be successful. You know, that, that's cool. That was cool. Yeah. Now, I, I don't think you should discount that. You know, I mean, when we, nope. it's, they're still, to me, on topic when they're doing something like yep. that. They're, they're just stretching where the topic goes. Yeah. Um, and yeah. to me, that's the side of, uh, of a higher degree of learning anyway, right? Discussion. Yeah, exactly. Making exactly. figures. Yep. Uh, Socrates would be proud, even yes, if it was just yes. that, right? Yeah. So um, mine is not nearly as interesting or as impactful in yours as in student learning. Uh, I just thought, uh, you know, uh, my wife uh, literally yesterday just did an amazing job of painting our uh, dining room. She'd been wanting to do it forever, and now it's like, you know, it went from being a very neutral color all the way around. Mm -hmm. The top uh, is a dark navy blue, and the bottom is white. Real stark contrast, but it looks lovely. It's like That's it cool. Just, yeah, just like changes the whole landscape. I'm excited. Of it. Yeah, I'm excited she, to uh, see it. Uh, she was supposed to like paint it uh, like after our daughter went to bed, and then she just decided like as the day wore on, it's like nope, can't help. So she was just painting off and on all day when she wasn't on conference calls. So that's cool. Anyway, that's that's my little anecdote for today. So let's go ahead and get right into it. Uh, let's get into the digital teaching hack. Yeah, so we're doing something kind of way outside the box of a uh, normal here. And I actually, um, I'm a, I talked to him yesterday. I want to bring him in as a guest speaker. But I have a student right now in my mythology class who's designing a whole module for my students to do that's Dungeons and Dragons based. So he's creating this all on his own. And I'm like, dude, like, you don't, you don't have to do this. He's like, no, 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 this is what I enjoy. Like, this is, this is my wheelhouse. So I'm like, okay. So we're actually going to explore an Egyptian tomb and we're going to use Zoom as our, as our medium to do it. So we're going to use breakout rooms and we're going to have leaders who basically lead students through a interactive uh, role play kind of theater of the mind experience. So for those of you that are like, do you know, well, it's like theater of the mind and we're going to explore these Egyptian tombs. The characters are going to play different classes that he actually designed himself based off of archetypes and based off of uh, Dungeons and Dragons. 
So like for instance, there's uh, an archeologist, just to open this up. He's made little character sheets um, for students to actually interact with. Uh, and this one, this one um, has impatient as a skill because they get, they get to go first. So the rules are like real, real simplified. Like they swing a weapon of a torch that has some like burning damage. But I mean, it's just, it's gonna be so much fun and we're building this together. Um, we're gonna create like a puzzle based kind of experience. And um, I'm actually real hopeful. Yesterday I had uh, almost 12 students in my Zoom call uh, for mythology working on an escape room. Like yeah. I have to like, I have to like pull teeth to get my English class students to come in and, and talk about the stuff that, you know, is grade related. But when it comes to mythology, like they're just piling in and we're having fun. Well, it goes back to a choice, right? You know, they, they chose to take mythology. Um, you know, in our school system, mythology doesn't get to count as like a replacement for a core uh, uh, ELA. So they are really choosing to go above and beyond, right? Yeah. Um, and yeah. So you know, those kids are centered in and they want to do it. But I think it also speaks a lot to like, you know, again, what curriculum and standards can do when it comes to like maybe hurting the love of learning yeah, versus, agreed. you know, the, the authority and creativity you have as a teacher when you have standards, but there's not this test or this thing that hangs over it um, that qualifies you as a good teacher or them as a good student or have they learned enough. Um, and there's pros and cons to all of that. I, I'm not anti-test necessarily, you know, when it comes mm -hmm. to trying to understand oh, who people are. But yeah, there's, assessment's there's, important. There's so much energy to what you just talked about, right? Like that, yeah. you, like you just said it. Like I can't. It'd be hard to do in your other classes um, versus what's happening there. All Definitely. right. Well, let's uh, let's get into the segment that we call "What's the Good Word." So, "What's the Good Word" is our opportunity to bring on a guest. And so today's guest again is I'm I'm really excited. I, I was I'm really stoked that she was willing to do it. Uh, so. Uh, Janelle Wilson is a former colleague who was over here in the States for a while. She has uh, since in the last couple of years found herself over in England. Um, she has a science background with a specialty in chemistry. Uh, she's got a really rich background in project-based learning too, but she's at the Hazley Academy in Milton Keynes, England, which is about 50 miles from London, but she talks about how it's only about 20 minute train ride, you know, when there's not a pandemic and people can get on a train together. Um, so we're really excited and uh, also interesting too, like instead of grades, they talk about years and she says, uh, so she does year seven to 13. So 13 would be like our, our senior year for our students. So without further ado, uh, Janelle, let's bring you on. Hello. Hey. Hi. So Hi, good Janelle. to see you. So what time is it over in your part of the world right now? It is 7.18. All right. So that's 2.18 here. So that, that five hour difference, it's, it's really yeah. great to um, be able to connect though. It's great to see you. Thank you for joining us. Yeah. yeah thank you. It's good to see you. Uh, so uh, we've got a just interest in general in like once this started to evolve in England, for instance, what what kind of happened, yep. right? What happened with your students, your administration, what decisions were made? Walk us through it. So we we had a pretty good idea it was coming for a few weeks. Um, you know, there was it was as it, the pandemic was spreading, but they kept saying we're not going to close schools yet. We're not going to close school yet. Schools yet. So we started doing some planning in the background we don't really have a clear platform for doing things online previously. Um, we have a we have this thing called Go for Schools, which is where we post homework assignments, but that's pretty much all you can do on it is say, this is what your homework is. Um, and some teachers were using Google Classrooms, and, but we went away from that to um, Office 365. So there was kind of, not sure what we we're going to do so there was kind of that prep work of getting things ready so about three weeks before we closed we started planning like two weeks of work for each year group um in order to kind of get ready and then the interesting thing is we we made the decision at one point before the the government closed schools to, to um only have a couple of the year groups continue to come into school because we had so many staff out and we just couldn't there was no way to cover all the classes. So we kept in our year sevens because they were the youngest year group, 
that's like sixth grade in the US and they just needed, you know, more supervision. And we brought in our year 11s and our year 13s, which are our, our two exam groups. Um, so we, we had that, um, we said that on the Wednesday. So the Thursday they came in and then that was the day the government, like the night before, said they were closing schools on the Friday, which was crazy. So then, and they canceled exams, which was a big deal for years 11 and 13. Um, so that was um, a few weeks ago. I should have looked at the exact date when that was. And it was a week after you guys closed in Georgia. Um, but yeah, so it was crazy because we didn't, we just didn't, don't have the infrastructure or we didn't have the infrastructure before we really got into yeah. it. Yeah, this this whole situation, I think, for most of us is going to to drive interesting innovation in, in all kinds of schoolhouses. Um, I found myself appreciating yes. what Gwinnett does because Gwinnett had a platform and teachers had been yes. trained on it. And, yeah, yes. you know, um, there, there are some teams. Yeah. Yeah, um, I think Gwinnett was definitely in a very prepared place to be. Going yeah. To yeah, and we still have students struggling, right? It's not like it was foolproof. It's yeah. uh, it's, it's not been perfect. Um, and you just no. mentioned, just like yeah. we had all our exams canceled, your big exams have been canceled as well. Uh, what's that ripple effect mm -hmm. been like for your students when you were trying to prepare them for it? So, you know, they're devastated, actually. You would think that students would be really excited to find out that they don't have to take exams. Um, and these are exams that they prepare for for a long period of time. So the the exams for a year 11, they've been working on and learning the material since year nine. So it's a three year course. Our, our A level students, it's a two year course. And it has big repercussions for their future, too, how they do on these exams, what they do for their next steps in their education. They were all devastated because they wanted to prove in their exams what they could do. They'd worked really hard. Uh, so they were kind of upset about it. Um, they, they still need grades in order to go to the next step. So we are working on a process with the government, have set out some recommendations and some specifications of what we do to give a center assessed grade. So we're testing center. So we're giving them what we think they would have gotten. And then there's some math going on in the background with that data so that they still get some sort of grade out of it at the end of the day. Yeah, I, I think my, my follow-up question was going to be, how have the universities and government, like, reacted to still allowing these kids to get into these universities, considering they can't take these exams? Yeah, so yeah exactly. So we're doing, yeah, so they, they've set up guidelines. Um, we have this uh, organization called OFCAL, which is part of the testing um, arm of the government that have laid out the guidelines of how to work out the center assessed grades so that everyone's still getting a grade at the end of the day. Yeah. That's just, it's kind of fascinating. Um, the other thing that I think is fascinating about what you're doing, when you told me this, I almost didn't believe you, but you were literally teaching 11 year olds to like 18 year olds. Um, that is a, that is a yes. wide swath of age ranges to try to educate. Wow. So one, I mean, maybe probably, yes. <laughs> probably challenging face to face, but like, what has that also been like having to go digital Ooh, with them? Yeah. Like supporting a sixth grader or uh, in our term yeah, sixth grade to a senior. You know, interestingly, the youngest, my year sevens, like the sixth graders, have been probably the most engaged and have gone into it, like, the most. I think they're really missing school and missing being with each other. So they just throw themselves into their schoolwork. So they, they're yeah. probably doing the best work. In person, it's really interesting. Um, the way our schedule works, we have, like, a fortnightly um, timetable for a schedule. So my day is different every day until it repeats on the next fortnight. It's, it's bizarre. Um, it's, I don't know my timetable by heart. I don't, I have to look, I have to read it in my planner in order to know it's insane. Um, uh, I thought block schedule was hard. Yeah, it's, it's insane. So, and I can go from teaching 11 year olds um, one hour and then the next hour teaching 18 year olds. So it's, it's insane. And we also set students. So we have like top sets and bottom sets and middle sets. So you can go from teaching a top set to a bottom. It, it's, it's crazy. But in terms of, of online, we were kind of in this, I don't, just trying to work out the best way to help our students. So the 11s and 13s, because they've canceled exams, they don't have to do anything now, like schoolwork related for their exams. So we're working with transition things for with those and that's kind of out of our hands so we're not having to worry about that that's being taken care of by our sixth form team which is what the years 12 and 13 are called um 
been we're about to what we're using as our platform is uh, Microsoft Teams class. Oh yes, yeah. That's yeah. Our platform. So I I made the mistake of becoming the expert by assigning it to all of our year <laughs> seven classes first. So now I know everything about it, and I'm training everyone else, uh, which is which is fun. So our year seven students had it in their science classes when we began. This week we rolled it out to all of our year ten and year twelve classes, and then next week it's going to roll out to everybody else. So we've yeah. been training the the teachers as well about how to use it, how to set things up, and it's so far that's working really well. Um, I like the platform. It's been it's, some learning curves, but it's a good one. Yeah. It's Working. a legit platform. I mean, that's something that yeah. you talk about real life application. I mean, that, that's global. That's amazing. Absolutely. That's a great opportunity. Yeah. yeah. And we've decided to do it right now, at least asynchronously. So we've got, we're recording video lessons for them mm -hmm. to watch and then they do some work and they, they turn it in that way because it's just easier. Yeah. Some, you know, some families have four kids at home and there's no way to do live lessons. So, yeah. well, uh, before we kind of get similar. out of the, the interview, I wanted to be able to ask you a fun question. I didn't send this to you ahead of time, but your background uh, okay. totally reminded me that you're of your love of space. So tell oh, us yes, what's going yes. on in space right now that everybody should know about and should be geeked out about right now. Well, um, Pandemic aside, hopefully on May 27th is going to be the first SpaceX crewed launch. Um, and so that is the U.S. Uh, return to space flight of uh, launching humans from, from the U.S. back to the space station. So that should be really cool to watch, uh, assuming that goes ahead on, on yeah. the 27th as planned. Um, yeah, so that would be really cool. Uh, there's there really launching cool. two astronauts on, on that. And then... And plus it'll be, you know, it's SpaceX, so that's really interesting. And then obviously SpaceX is still launching the, the CubeSats. They had another launch last night. So sometimes you can, can spot those. They're a little bit, not the CubeSats, sorry, the, oh, I forget what they're called now, but you know what I mean. Um, Starlink, that's what they are, yeah. the Starlink satellites. Yeah, so they're controversial because you can see them and people think that one day you won't be able to see the stars. Their orbit's going to be too high. It's not going to be that Right, so yeah, I've heard stargazers have made a big deal out of it, so. Yeah, yeah, they like to do that. I right. prefer, I'm more of like space exploration, so I'm more like Star Trek, let's get out there, so I think. Yeah, we'll... yeah, let's do it. I love it, yeah, I just, I, I had to ask, like I said, your background totally reminded me um, that your connection with, with love of space yes. and some of the cool stuff you've done, you know. Yes. I remember when yeah. you were still at Lanier, uh, you gave the kids the opportunity to talk to astronauts that were in orbit. Yeah. The space station was yeah. right over us at the time. Yeah. Uh, That's so you missed out on that one, man. I did yeah. miss out on that. Yeah, it was like awesome. Said, ripples, yeah. Ripples. Oh, that was so cool. <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah. All right. Well, um, normally we would uh, we we would do an outro, um, but uh, but today, due to a uh, conflict that I have and needing to, to get to another uh, meeting as part of the job, we won't worry about like a traditional outro necessarily. Uh, but we do want to wish everybody to uh, to be safe and healthy out there. Janelle, thank you again so yeah, much. This for is so cool. Us. Thank you. This was great. We really appreciate it. Um, yeah. And uh, awesome. we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll keep connecting and stuff. And uh, sorry that it took this for me to reach back out to you, but we'll, we'll try to stay in touch. All right. Yeah, definitely. All right. All right. Okay. Everybody be safe out there. Thank you. Thank you.